Go ahead and take a seat, and as you're doing so, grab your Bibles, your apps, whatever you read on, uh, and turn to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. Now, before I go any further, happy Mother's Day. If you are a mother, a grandmother, we are so glad, and we are thankful for who you are and what you have done. Uh, I know that I am very thankful for my mother. Uh, I am thankful for my wife, although I will confess to you right now, I have no idea why my wife married me. Um, and, and I'll tell you a story to just illustrate why I think this. So imagine, uh, my wife and I have been married almost 13 years, not quite. Um, imagine, it's the summer of 2003, I had hair back then. Um, and I was the youth minister in a small town called Happy, Texas. That's right, there's a place called Happy, Texas, population 654. Um, it's not exactly a place you want to visit. Um, but anyways, I was the youth minister at a small Baptist church there in Happy. And uh, I was uh, hanging out with the teenagers one uh, afternoon. It was a Sunday afternoon. We were getting ready to have youth. Jana had gone to youth with me. Uh, and so I want you to picture this. We're sta sitting and standing in front of, our, front of the church. And the church had a, a long set of steps that led up to the front door. And Jana is sitting on the steps uh, with a group of teenage girls just talking, building relationships, speaking into their lives. Uh, and I'm standing kind of over beside her, throwing a football with the guys, being a good youth pastor, super holy. And so I had thrown the football to this guy, to one of my boys, um, and he catches the football. And, and after I'd thrown it, one of the other teenagers that was uh, over on the steps with us had gotten my attention. So I looked over and was talking to this other teenager. And in the midst of that, I heard, look out! Well, the teenager that I had thrown the ball to did not realize that I had looked away and thrown the ball back. Now, mind you, my wife is sitting right beside me. Now, you would think as a super spiritual pastor guy that I should have jumped in front of that ball in a sacrificial act of love. Um, you would think wrong. Um, I heard look out and I ducked. <laughs> and that ball proceeded to bean my wife in the head. Now she was my girlfriend at the time, so I'm not really sure why she stayed with me after that. Um, but she did and I am very, very thankful uh, for that. We're going to be talking about relationships today. So I'm going to just briefly echo what Miss Julie said during the welcome. If you have children in here, we're going to be talking about some delicate subjects. And if you don't want your children hearing those subjects or that discussion, no shame in going and checking them in to our uh, Ch uh, Calvary Kids ministry right now. Uh, no one's going to shame you or uh, look down on you for doing that because believe me, some of you may not want your kids to hear this. So we're going to be looking at Proverbs. Now, I want to remind you, we've said this at the beginning of every uh, message that's in this series on Proverbs. Think about why and how Proverbs was written. First off, Proverbs is a book of wisdom. It's written by a father to his sons, okay? So please keep in mind that we're gonna be talking about a few things today and a lot of the passages are very specifically directed to men or boys uh, about girls, okay? But... The wisdom that is contained within Proverbs applies to all of the genders, to both of the genders. So the ideas that I'm going to be uh, bringing forth, even though the passage may be very specific towards guys or girls, they apply to all of us, no matter what gender we are, okay? So that's what it says. Proverbs talks about relationships, romantic relationships, actually quite extensively. So I told you to turn to Proverbs chapter 6. So open that up. We're going to be in verse 27 and 28. So Proverbs 6, verses 27 and 28. And it says this. Can a man carry a fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? Now, this passage is in the midst of a long passage talking about 
um, relationships. And so this passage actually right here, even though it's talking about grabbing hot coals, is referring to uh, relationship issues, okay? And so let let me throw this out because this is kind of a weird statement, let's be honest. But I don't know about you, but when I have a fire pit in my backyard and I'm looking down in the fire and there's a log with the embers burning and it's kind of glowing red, I don't know about you, but I don't have the temptation to reach down in that fire and give that burning log a hug, do you? No, not at all. As a matter of fact, I keep a safe distance from that burning log. I don't touch it directly. And so this is a very much over-the-top uh, illustration of an idea that God wants us to learn today. And so let me say this. Have you ever noticed that not just the Bible, but also culture makes a link between attraction to someone and heat? Have you ever noticed that? Let me give you an example. When you see someone that is really attractive of the opposite sex, what do you say? She's hot, smoking. Woo, man, she's hot, right? Um, what, do, uh, what, what do you say when you've gotten a little too worked up, you need to go home and take a cold shower, right? Um, if you wanna get super old school with this, you can say, woo, that creates a burning in my loins. There has always been a connection between heat and attraction. Even Proverbs uses that here. And so Proverbs warns us in chapter six about the dangers of fire. And so I'm going to use that illustration this morning to demonstrate what we're talking about. So here's the first thing that I want you guys to understand about attraction. Um, Understand the fire so you don't get burned. Understand the fire so you don't get burned. You see, God has given us a design for marriage and sexual relationships. He has. And he's put boundaries on what that looks like. And those boundaries apply to all of us, whether we're single, married, divorced, over the age of 60. It doesn't matter who you are, what age range, what marital status, it doesn't matter. These boundaries apply to all of us. And here's the thing, God did not give us those boundaries to remove the fun from our lives. He gave us those boundaries to keep us safe. So let's follow this fire illustration for a second. Let's say you get up one morning and you're walking your dog down the street and about half a block ahead, you see a gas tank on fire, okay? Now, As you're looking at this gas tank on fire, you look and you see some really brilliant yellow colors coming through the flames with some iridescent oranges and ever so often there's a spark of green and blue that pops up and it's gorgeous. It's it's a beautiful sight to see. Do you look at that fire and go, oh, I wanna get closer and I wanna warm my hands on that fire from that gas tank? Is that what the response is that you have when you see that? No, you run the other way and call the police because what's about to happen with that gas tank? It's about to explode. And if you're nearby, that explosion is gonna blow up in your face and it's gonna hurt you. And that's the illustration that God has for us here in Proverbs. Those boundaries that he has put on sexual relationships are not to remove our fun. Those boundaries are keeping us from getting things blown up in our face and hurting us. And so the fact is, is that we have to understand what these boundaries are, and the boundary is simple. Do not indulge in in adultery. Now adultery, both in the Old and New Testament, are defined very simply. Adultery is this, anything that is outside of a marriage relationship. Anything sexual outside of a marriage relationship is considered by the Old and New Testament to be adultery. So if you're single, adultery means anything sexual because God has designed sexual relationship to be within a marriage. If you're married, it means everything sexual needs to maintain and stay within that marriage relationship. 
Not someone else's marriage relationship, not someone else's single relationship within your married relationship. And so adultery is that flame, that burning gas tank that God says, don't go near this, avoid this. Because it may be pretty at first and it may warm your hands, but there's gonna come a point that that adultery is gonna blow up in your face and you're gonna get hurt. And you're gonna hurt anyone around you as well. And so we have to be cautious about that. So if you're single, it's a simple matter of putting up healthy boundaries on the relationships that you have. You need to have standards. You need to have an understanding of what you're gonna allow within that relationship and what you're not gonna allow and how to avoid those things from happening, the things you're gonna allow and not allow. If you're married, same thing. You need to understand the boundaries that you need to put up in your outside of marriage relationships with your friends at work, or just friends that you hang out with. You need to have proper, healthy relationship boundaries. So if you're single or married, you need to understand this then. You need to understand fire control. You need to understand fire control, okay? So how to maintain a healthy marriage. How to maintain and bless your marriage relationships. So if you're single in this room right now, take notes for future relationships. If you're married, you need to take notes about your relationship right now and walk out the door and apply some things to your marriage relationship. And so the first way that we practice fire control is this. Care for your fire once it's yours. Care for your fire once it's yours. Proverbs 5 verses 18 and 19 say this, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. That's some beautiful poetry. Beautiful imagery of what a healthy marriage attraction should look like. And I love the wording, but especially the wording, wife of your youth. It says, rejoice in the wife of your youth. So what does that mean? What does it mean to rejoice in the wife of your youth, or ladies, in the husband of your youth? Well, I wanna look at a few things and how this applies. First off, It's in the way that you look at your spouse, the way you see them. So you need to see, I need to see our spouse through the lens, through the eyes that we saw them when we first married them or when we were dating. My wife is a perfect example of this. When she married me, I had a full head of hair and I lost almost all of it in two years. I pulled the ultimate bait and switch on my wife. But the fact is, is that my wife still looks at me, even though I've gained some weight and I'm old and I've got a lot of gray and not much hair on top, my wife still looks at me the same way she looked at me 14 years ago when we were dating. And I still look at her the same way that she looked in my mind back then. I still look at my wife and go, man, she's hot. I don't tell you people that all the time, but I do feel that for her because I make a conscious decision to look at her with the eyes that I looked at her when we first started dating. And so you've got to look at your spouse through the eyes of your youth. It's also the way you think about your spouse. Now, I told you I grew up in Texas where 19 out of 20 radio stations are country stations, and 19 out of 20 country songs are about a girl, okay? Now, back in the day when I would listen to a country station, because that was all that they offered, um, what I heard was a lot of romantic songs. And so I have over the years made a point when a romantic song comes on, no matter what the genre of music that's playing, I think about my wife, 
I don't think about some other woman. I don't think about someone that I saw at church the other day. I don't think about someone I saw down at the restaurant on Wednesday. I don't think about anybody else when I hear a romantic song other than my wife. I make a point, and I'm encouraging you to do so as well, because I'm not the perfect example, but I'm encouraging you to, when you think about your spouse, to think about them in a godly, positive, and quite honestly, a sexual way. You need to focus your romantic thoughts and efforts on your spouse, not on anyone else. The, the, the romanticizing of other rom- relationships, the dreaming about the grass on the other side, those things are off limits as a married person. Your spouse is the number one thought outside of God, because God is the top, but God's next for you is for your spouse to be the number one thought in your mind. And again, it has to be intentional. It's also in the way that you treat them. Proverbs has something interesting to say about this. If you read Proverbs 21, verse nine, it says, it is better to live in a corner on the housetop of your house uh, than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. Now, men, that's, I better not see anybody building a little shanty on the roof of your house this week. That's not what this means. The idea behind this passage is simple. It is that we as men and women who are married are supposed to live together with gentleness, with respect, with kindness, with love, rather than fighting and bickering and pushing against one another. The idea is that we're supposed to love one another and we're supposed to express that love. And it's a simple matter of saying kind things and thinking through what you're gonna say before you say them. And so live in kindness. It involves how you speak to your spouse. So Proverbs 16, 24 says this, gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. So the words that come out of your mouth to your spouse should be dripping with honey not with poison. You should be constantly looking at ways to verbally bless your spouse rather than driving them down. And so it's how you treat them, it's how you speak to them, it's how you think about them, it's how you look at them, but it's also how you make them a priority. That the, the design that God gave us for marriage is that God is number one. He is the top of our priority list. And then he gives us a priority list that we live our life by. And the top of his priority list for us is marriage. Your spouse is the top of God's priority list for you. And so make your spouse a priority. Maybe you need to start dating your spouse again. When was the last time you took your spouse on a date? When was the last time you surprised your spouse with something nice? It's that process of making your spouse the top, the number one, the most important relationship that you have under God. So, we're talking about fire control, and the first aspect of that is care for your fire. The second aspect of it is stay away from fire that is not yours. Stay away from fire that is not yours. Proverbs 5, verses 20 through 23 say this. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an an adulteress? For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is led fast to the cords of his in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. The idea here that we get from Proverbs 5 is that we, as followers of Christ, are supposed to avoid adulterous temptations. Those temptations that are outside of God's boundaries, we're supposed to do our best to avoid those kinds of temptations. And again, this applies whether you're single, divorced, married, uh, young, old, doesn't matter. We need to have healthy boundaries on the relationships we have outside of our marriage. So uh, let me give you some wise advice that's 
practical and biblical. And there's some controversy about what I'm about to say. Uh, Our vice president made a statement about this and people got upset about it. But I think there's a lot of wisdom here considering the rate of uh, affairs in the United States today is estimated, depending on the study that you read, anywhere between 50 and 70% of couples will cheat. So I don't care who you are, this is a problem, this is a plague in our society today. <clears throat> and the, the rules, the, the boundaries, the, the, the things that we've done to protect our marriages aren't working. So let's look at some healthier, more biblical ways to protect our marriage. So first off, whether you're single or married, be cautious about how you spend time with the opposite sex. Be cautious. So me personally, and my standards are not your standards. I'm just giving you an example of what, how this applies in my life. I don't ever spend time with a woman without someone with me. So if I'm going to go to lunch with a female, someone's going to come along with me. Now, there have been a couple of occasions where <clears throat> the three of us ha- have planned lunch and that other person bailed on us. But I make a conscious effort to not spend time with women unless there's someone else around because I don't want that temptation. I don't want to deal or have that struggle in my life. I still counsel women, but I do it with certain boundaries. When I am counseling a woman and it's just me and a woman that I'm counseling, I do it in an office that has a window so that anytime someone can walk by and just peek in very briefly and make sure that everything's okay. That is accountability for me. Romans 13, 14 says, remove any temptations from your life. Put barriers up between you and what may tempt you. And so that's the way my barriers work. Your barriers are different. But have healthy boundaries with the way you spend time with the opposite sex. Uh, And tied to that, never, and this is not a uh, just, this is how OC does it. No, this is a psychological Um, pretty much fact. Don't ever confide deep emotional thoughts with someone of the opposite sex unless it's your spouse or your parent. Because what do you do the moment you begin to share intimate details and thoughts and emotions? What do you do with that other person? You build an intimate connection with them. Think about when you dated your spouse. When you dated your spouse, what did you share while you talked on the phone for two hours every single night? Intimate details, thoughts, emotions. That's why it's not healthy for us to share and confide intimate emotions and details and thoughts with someone of the opposite sex because that innately builds an emotional, intimate connection with that other person. You're basically, in that moment, by sharing that confidential information, you're building an intimate relationship with them whether you want to or not. So don't ever do that. That's not a healthy situation. Now, it's interesting when uh, our staff was talking about this particular message uh, and what kind of things we wanted to bring up and talk about in the message. Uh, Pastor Chad, our lead pastor, said, you know what? Every time I've ever had a temptation like this in my life, he goes, I've just gone and read Proverbs 5, 6, and 7. And everybody was like, okay, why? And he goes, Proverbs 5, 6, and 7 gives us a very good example of what happens if we indulge in adulterous relationships. So those three chapters of Proverbs, chapters five, six, and seven, give illustrations like this. First off, the one that we've been using, taking hot coals and pressing them to your chest, that's not something I want for my life. Uh, I don't have that desire. I don't, like I said, I don't pick a burning log up out of my fire pit and hug it. That's not something I know better, right? But here's another illustration that five, six, and seven gives us. Adultery is like an ox being led to the slaughter. How many of you want to be led to slaughter? Oh yeah, come on. I know there's some of you that just want to be slaughtered today. No, so why would we step into an adulterous relationship? Why not avoid that relationship altogether? Another illustration that it gives is being shot in the liver. How many of you woke up this morning or any time this week or month, woke up and said, you know what sounds good today? I'm gonna go get shot in the liver. That just sounds like something really fun. 
No, that's not a thought we have. Most of us in this room dread the thought of a needle or anything, let alone getting shot by something in the liver. But that's the illustration that Proverbs chapters 5, 6, and 7 give us about what adultery will end up doing to us. And over and over it says this, adulterous relationships are the pathway, are literally the road that takes us to death. In other words, you're gonna destroy any time that we step into an adulterous relationship, we destroy, we kill something. We hurt someone, if not ourselves. There's nothing good that comes out of an adulterous relationship. Now, I've been hounding and pounding on this idea of adultery and the do's and don'ts and what's and nots and this and that. But let's be very honest. Let's be frank here. Most of us, many of us in this room, including myself, have already burned ourselves. Guys, I'll be honest. I was not wise when it came to the relationships that I had until I started dating my wife, actually. My wife was the first relationship that my wife and I put healthy boundaries on our relationships to avoid getting burned but I didn't do that with any of my other relationships. And I made stupid, idiotic decisions. I didn't listen to the wisdom of Proverbs. And I've been burned, and I've burned others in the process. If you're in that boat, if you've been hanging out too much around the flaming gas tank, I have a word of hope. God can heal any burn. God can heal any burn. Listen to uh, what Proverbs 4, 20, and 22, 20 through 22 says. My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. You see, we serve a God that's not just able to redeem. He wants to redeem. So let me give you an illustration of this. A few years ago, uh, my wife and I took some high schoolers on a skiing snowboarding trip. Great trip, we went to Brian, Utah, uh, Brian Head, Utah. It was a great trip, we had so much fun. We took Knox, and Knox at the time was, I think he was somewhere around three years old. And so we had a day full of snowboarding and skiing. We got back to uh, the lodge, and a couple of people were in the kitchen cooking dinner. And one of the things that was cooking was a, a, a cookie sheet full of cookies. Cookies got done. They took the cookie sheet out, set it on top of the stove, shut the oven door, turned to get a spatula. And in that second to two seconds, Knox had wandered into the kitchen and reached up and grabbed the cookie sheet. Now, what do you think happened? <laughs> Screamed bloody murder. Let go of the pan right? And in that moment, we all scrambled to take care of little Knox. You know, we're, 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 you know, doing everything you're supposed to do. We took the heat out. We, 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 we medicated it. Third degree burn, blisters, whole nine yards. I mean, it was, it was one of those moments that's heart-wrenching for a father. But in that moment, as his father, was there anything that was more desired in my heart than to heal him and comfort him? There's nothing I wanted more in that moment. As my son is screaming and he's crying, there is not a thing that I wanted more in that moment than to be able to comfort him and heal him. Guys, our God is the exact same way with us. It's not that he just, oh, I can heal you, here you go. His desire, his heart-wrenching want is to heal us. When we're feeling pain, when our soul, when our spirit is crying out to God, he doesn't just go, oh, here you go. He desires to wrap us up in his arms and love on us and heal us from the pain that we've endured. Just like I wanted to heal Knox and I wanted nothing more than to be able to comfort him in that moment, that's what God wants for you. That's how God embraces you. So if you've been burned, if you've burned someone else, God wants to heal that situation. 
if you're in a marriage that the fire is going out, God wants to restoke that fire. He wants that fire to burn healthy again, and he wants to be the one to help it burn healthy again. But here's the thing. Me as a father, go back to that situation. I want to heal my son, I want to comfort my son, but if my son continually reaches up and grabs that cookie sheet over and over and over again, is there anything that I can do? No. There's nothing I can do in that situation. The same is true for us. If we want God to heal us, we've got to step back from the fire. We've got to recognize the flaming gas tank that's in front of us and step away from it and embrace his wisdom and his boundaries so that we can begin the process of healing in our lives. We have to recognize it. And so here's my question. What needs to change in your life to keep, from, keep you from getting burned? What boundaries do you need to put up? And then secondly, what do you need to do in order to begin healing from your past burns? Will you join me in prayer?